Hey, welcome to Casual Friday here on Digital Charcuterie. I'm Andrew Fantasia. Hello, everybody. Happy Casual Friday. Happy May 12th. And to those who celebrate, happy Zelda Day. Yeah, because it's Zelda Day. Zelda Tears of the Kingdom came out today, and I am fully, you know, locked in. I am in Zelda mode. I have been counting down the minutes to this game. I haven't been this excited for a video game in a long time. So forgive me. Uh, my mind is here with you, but it's also preoccupied with swords and knights and castles and Ganon and all of that fun stuff. And speaking of which, if you happen to enjoy swords and castles and knights and fantasy stories in particular, maybe you might want to do us both a favor and head on over to Amazon where you can get my fantasy novel series, the first two books of which have come out and are available right now. It's called We Were Wizards. See right there on this little white banner part, We Were Wizards is the name of the series. And these two books, Seekers of the Stones and Ghosts of Wizards Past are available right now on Amazon in hardcover, in ebook and in paperback. So check those out now if you're a fantasy fan or if you have a fantasy fan in your life. And be sure to leave a review on Amazon so that Bezos doesn't bury me in his algorithm. It would help me out a lot as an up and coming independent author. We were wizards. It's got wizards, I promise. But you know what else has wizards? Star Wars. It has the word wizards and it has space wizards, but we're actually not talking about Star Wars. We're talking about other things today. I just want to say Star Wars because saying Star Wars out loud makes me happy. We got a question from a fan here, and that's what we like to do on Casual Friday or Digital Charcuterie. We like to take question emails from fans, from listeners all over the world, and talk about them here on the show. So here is my question for this week. This question comes from Siobhan Laner. I hope I'm saying your name right. Uh, thank you for writing in, Siobhan. Siobhan asks, do you think James Gunn, Superman legacy movie, will make $1 billion? Sorry, I couldn't resist. I couldn't resist doing the Dr. Evil Clinky. Do I think Superman legacy by James Gunn will make $1 billion? Hmm. It's going to depend on two things, Siobhan. I think it's going to depend on, A, the marketing for the movie. Because at the end of the day, bad marketing can kill a great movie. Just ask the people who made John Carter, uh, which is still one of the best sci-fi movies ever made, in this guy's opinion. And it is criminal that it lost so much money because it was not marketed well at all. So Superman Legacy needs good marketing. Obviously, Superman is a bigger name than John Carter. So as soon as you see that shield and the blue suit and the red cape, it's going to make people want to go see it. And this is a very popular talked about movie. And it's the uh, inception of this new DC universe. So yes, it's going to make big, big money. Is it going to make a billion dollars though? Uh, well, I looked back at Man of Steel which was also the first Superman movie in a long time and also promising to kickstart a DC cinematic universe. And it had a big name director behind it with Zack Snyder. So I looked at Man of Steel and I checked out how much it made. And according to Wikipedia, the box office is hovering around $668 million, which is interesting. Uh, I think that's a good amount of money from Man of Steel, word of mouth when that movie was out wasn't amazing. People were just saying it was kind of a mid-tier film. So maybe word of mouth kept it from reaching greater heights. Superman Legacy, I think that's going to be a different story. Do I think it'll make a billion dollars? Maybe not. But will it make more than Man of Steel? Heck yes. And there are several reasons why. Number one, because James Gunn right now is a much hotter name and commodity than Zack Snyder was back then. Uh, he's coming fresh off the heels of this amazing Guardians of the Galaxy trilogy, which we'll talk about more in a minute, um, as well as his really, really good Suicide Squad movie, which was a lot of fun. So he comes with all this comic book pedigree to his name already. He's got these four comic book movies under his belt that have made intense money like they've done gangbusters so to throw all of that in the mix with superman 
arguably next to Spider-Man, the most recognizable comic book character ever. And Batman, Batman's pretty recognizable. But you throw that into the mix, and I think you've got a recipe for a movie that is going to make big money just on the merits of its own existence. Then you worry about things like marketing and you worry about things like word of mouth. Is word of mouth going to be positive? We don't know because we don't know what this movie's like. Once it exists, we'll start hearing through the grapevine what people say. We're going to hear the whispers of, hey, Superman Legacy was okay. Hey, Superman Legacy wasn't my favorite, but I liked it better than Man of Steel. Or, man, Superman Legacy was a big letdown. This DC universe is going down the tubes. Or Superman Legacy is amazing. This is going to be the greatest DC universe ever. It could go any way. Based on Gunn's track record, I think I'm just going to throw out just a prediction here based on what we've seen. I feel like James Gunn is the kind of filmmaker who is going to give us the Superman movie we need and not necessarily the Superman movie we want. I think he's going to give us a movie that's more in tune with The Last Jedi than with The Force Awakens, right? Uh, it's going to be a movie that you're going to watch and you're going to be like, damn, that's really, really good. But a lot of the masses are going to walk out of that movie feeling like they didn't get the Superman movie that they had in their head. That's just the kind of filmmaker James Gunn has proven to be. All the Guardians movies were like that. Suicide Squad was like that. Uh, you know, He set up a formula with Guardians 1, even though it's hard to set up a formula with one movie. But he set up expectations with Guardians 1. After Guardians 1, we knew what to expect. We knew what we were in for. And then what happened? We all went into Guardians 2, and it was a very different kind of movie. And for a long while, we thought, yeah, we had fun, but I think I like Guardians 1 better. And then eventually, we had to process it more. At least I'm speaking from my experience. I processed it more, and I watched it again, and I watched part one again, and I really kind of looked at them side by side as two very separate pieces of art. And all of a sudden, I came to the conclusion, I was like, damn. I love part one, but I love part two even more. Part two crept up on me with how amazing it was. And I'm going through kind of the same motions with part three right now, where I'm like, it might be my least favorite, even though I think it's like spectacular and I have nothing really to complain about. And maybe who knows, two years down the road, I might look at it and be like, that's the best Guardians movie. I feel like Superman Legacy is going to work the same way. It's going to have mixed word of mouth going to have people saying this is not what I wanted. It's going to have people saying it's the best Superman movie ever. And that mixed word of mouth is going to keep it from reaching billion dollar heights. But it's going to be the kind of movie that creeps up on us as the years go by and make us think, you know what? That might have been the best Superman movie ever made. Uh, and I know that that sounds like not what a lot of people want to hear, but that's filmmaking, right? That's art. You're going to get art that is exactly what you want. You're going to get art that's not exactly what you want. But it's our job as purveyors of said art to just kind of sit back and let it wash over us and really think about why it made us feel the way it made us feel, which is half the fun. So Siobhan, I don't think we can look forward to a billion dollar price tag at the end of Superman Legacy, but I do think it's going to soar like Superman himself to some pretty lofty heights. And I think it's safe to say it's going to make more than Man of Steel, more than 668 mil, so or 698 mil, or whatever that was. Uh, so thank you very much for your question. Now, on the topic of James Gunn movies, we're going to stick with that for the main topic of today's Casual Friday, because we're talking about Guardians of La Galaxia, Volume 3. Now, it's been a week since the movie has come out, so I am going to put a nice, big, that spoiler warning right here for all of you, because we are going to talk about spoilery stuff, and I just want to get you prepared for that, uh, because I want to ask the question, I want us to ponder this all together here, the Guardians of the Galaxy, spoilers begin now, you've been warned, the Guardians of the Galaxy at the end of this movie, I think surprised a lot of people, because not a single one of them is dead, right? We all kind of collectively, and again, this is part of people going in expecting art to be one thing and then it's something else. We all walked into this film expecting a guardian, at least one guardian, 
to perish. A lot of people had money on Rocket. A lot of people had money on Drax. And by the time the credits rolled and we were done and we walked back out into the sunlight, hey, guess what? Every single member of the Guardians of the Galaxy is alive and well. And not only that, but they've added more characters to their roster. Now, it's already been said and everybody already knows this, so I'm not breaking any kind of news here, right? Don't stop the presses. But James Gunn has said this is his final Guardians film. He's stepping away. He's ending the story he started telling in part one. And this film is meant to signify the end of that trilogy and the end of this iteration of the Guardians of the Galaxy as we know it. So moving forward, if there are ever more stories to tell with this group, it's going to be under an entirely different group name. Uh, and now we're going to talk about Guardians in uh, specifically this movie in a lot more detail on the Infinity Rewatch podcast. Myself and Ryan J. Whitehead, we're going to uh, be talking about that. That was recorded last night, so you may have already listened to it. If not, you can go ahead and give it a listen wherever you get your podcasts. Um, actually, that is on the uh, Rebel Scum Podcast Network. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm mixing up my networks here. You can listen to the Infinity Rewatch coverage of Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 on the Rebel Scum Podcast Network. Wherever you get your podcasts, it's our sister channel here on YouTube. Um, James is there. Brock is there. Sometimes I'm there. Rob Darth Ward is there. We have a great old time talking about Star Wars. And we sneak in Infinity Rewatch, which is our Marvel show every once in a while. So you can get a more detailed look at what Ryan and I thought about the movie there. But in terms of where the Guardians are leading off, I'm just going to give my two cents. And please, in the comments, give your two cents or your two quatloos or whatever. I don't know what the money's called that the Guardians use. I don't think we've ever heard it mentioned. Space bucks. But... Here's where I think we might, if at all, see the Guardians in the future. First of all, easy answers here that we can tick off are Gamora and Drax. Because even though Gamora and Drax are alive, uh, Zoe Saldana and Dave Batista have both said they are done playing these characters. They had a wonderful time, but they're stepping away. They're finished. So I think it's safe to say we probably won't see them in the MCU again. Uh, they had a good run and they, they kind of finished their arcs, especially Gamora, who is dead. And this is now just another Gamora who has found another arc that finished in this film. We don't need them again. Of course, it'd be nice to see them because they're like old friends. But Gamora and Drax, I think we can safely say the MCU is done with them and we're moving forward. Rocket and Groot. Now, Rocket and Groot are headlining the new roster of the Guardians of the Galaxy, as we saw in the mid-credit scene, along with Kraglin, with Cosmo the Space Dog, with Adam Warlock, with that furry thing that Adam Warlock has just decided to adopt, and with a new character, Phyla, uh, one of the star children that they rescue, and uh, she's an old-school Marvel Comics character as well from the cosmic corner of things. So if we do see Rockin' and Groot again, that is, I believe, our most likely uh headliner duo for a hypothetical guardians volume four if at any point a guardians volume four is greenlit and made that's where we can expect to see rocket and Groot. they're the ones that are going to show up uh front and center on that team we'll probably get cosmo and craglin i mean we might not get craglin because he kind of works with his brother and if james gunn's not around maybe sean gunn might step down who knows uh, but we'll, I think it's safe to say we'll get Cosmo and we'll see Adam Warlock in there and Philavel. And uh, we might even get new characters introduced like um, Moondragon and Quasar. So that's a possibility. But I feel like that's where Rocket and Groot would end up. What about Nebula? Nebula has had a wonderful arc throughout the Three Guardians movies and the Avengers movies where she has slowly but surely gone from uh, a hench, henchwoman villain to a member of the team. And now she's a full-on hero. So for Nebula, I believe Nebula is one of the characters that we can look forward to kind of seeing as a surprise somewhere else. Because Karen Gillan has said she would love to continue playing Nebula. So maybe she might be the first one we see again. Uh, she might be the first one that comes back in some way in some big crossover story or something. Maybe it's in an Avengers film. Right, Maybe it's in Kang Dynasty or Secret Wars. I, I feel like she made an impact in Endgame. Endgame really, 
featured Nebula way more than I thought it would. So she feels like an Avengers character now. So it wouldn't feel out of place if come time for Avengers 5 or Avengers 6, they're like, hey, Nebula, here you go. Front and center, you're, you're back with the team. You're back with the core group of Avengers. Why not? That seems like a great place to put her. And we know that she is spending her time on nowhere taking care of these kids. So that can explain her absence. Um, and it also gives us, you know, ample reason to go back and visit. And it won't feel out of place for her to leave nowhere and go on other adventures. What about Mantis? Mantis is on a journey of self-discovery. She is cruising through the galaxy with her three new giant pets that look like Rathtars. So I'm just going to call them Rathtars because I can't remember what they're actually called. And she's on a journey of self-discovery to find out what her deal is, um, which was a very sweet, bittersweet moment at the end of this film. In terms of where or when we could see Mantis again, I believe she could be lumped in with another character that we got introduced to, which was Adam Warlock. Uh, who is now a member of the Galax, uh, a member of the Guardians of the Galaxy, rather. But I feel like Mantis and Adam Warlock both are almost a given, almost a given, as characters that we will meet when we inevitably meet the Silver Surfer. We know he's coming. We know he's coming. We don't know when or where or how. There's been talks of him being introduced in another Disney Plus hour-long special, which feels kind of... You know, I'm just going to say it. It was kind of like an underwhelming place to introduce a character as big as a Silver Surfer, but it worked for Werewolf by Night and Man-Thing and also Bloodstone. So yeah, why not? Um, that's all the word we've gotten on him so far. But when he comes into the picture, and it's only a matter of time till he does, Adam Warlock is definitely the kind of character that interacts with the Surfer. So you are going to see Adam. That is, you can take that to the bank, the space bank where you get your space bucks. Mantis, because she's cruising the galaxy and doing her own thing, feels like she would be the, the key kind of character to interact with him and maybe even discover the surfer or discover Galactus through this or whatever, you know, discover one of the heralds. She could be the one that introduces the audience to that pocket of the cosmic universe, right? We could be following her on some adventure she's having. And then all of a sudden she's like, ooh, what is this? It's... Terax, and then she meets Harold, and we we get introduced to that story, and it starts crossing over with what the Fantastic Four are doing. So Mantis seems the most exciting because that feels like it could really make sense in the grand scheme of things. It really fits. It could also be something uh, as simple as a cameo in the Marvels, because the Marvels is going to be a very cosmic space adventure. But, and I've heard people talk about that so far this week already people saying hey maybe she's going to show up in the marvels maybe the marvels is too soon because we literally just said goodbye to mantis uh it doesn't feel out of place but i would say that's probably too soon uh, i would hope they would wait a while before we get her again uh and then the final character that we're waiting on to see again is peter quill himself is star lord and as the post credit scene told us the legendary star lord will return but he's living on earth now with his grandpa so where will he return in an earth-based story no doubt right an earth-based story is the best place right call him out of retirement call him out of wherever it is his grandfather lives iowa or whatever and get him involved in what's happening in whatever that story may be whether it's captain america five whether it's uh Again, I don't want to say secret invasion because that's just too soon. Let's give him space to breathe. But at some point, uh, there's plenty of stories that are going to be taking place on Earth, uh, more so than any other settings, uh, where it would be totally fitting to have Star-Lord show up. Uh, so I'm going to say, based on what we know is coming out, um, I'm going to say if we see him in anything that's been announced so far, See, I don't think we are. I don't think we're going to see him in anything that's been announced so far, except maybe an Avengers film. So maybe King Dynasty is our next glimpse of Star-Lord. Um, and that is not even necessarily going to be said on Earth, but I'm just guessing that based on what we've seen, because I feel like everything else, Blade, he wouldn't fit. Captain America mm, still might not be the right fit for Star-Lord. Uh, Fantastic Four, I've 
feel, and I hope, and that probably is going to be a period piece, so I don't think we're going to see Star-Lord at all. So I feel like the Kang Dynasty is our best bet to next encounter our buddy Peter Quill. But that's my two space buck cents of where the Guardians could return. Now, the question is for everybody watching and listening. What do you think? Where are the Guardians uh, going to show up next and when? Will they be in projects we've already heard of or in a soon-to-be-revealed project? Let us know in the comments below. Until then, everybody, thank you so much for joining me here on Casual Friday on the Digital Charcuterie channel. May you be the masters of your own universe. Ciao for now.